A number of charges ensued, and within an hour the field was strewn with dead and dying horses and Cossacks. By then I was utterly sick of shooting horses. One Cossack got to within fifty metres of our position. I fired a round into the breastbone of his horse. The instant I did so, the animal jumped over a cadaver and the bullet ripped into the belly region, spilling out its intestines. The animal stopped, quivering, the rider seated as if paralysed on its back. The horse seemed to stare directly at me with wide, sad, questioning eyes, almost as if asking why. I gave the creature the coup de grace in the forehead, while a spray of MP-40 fire finished off the rider. The next wave of cavalry made inroads into our positions, so close that I hid my sniper's rifle and fought with the MP-40. Our original eleven-man platoon had been whittled down to seven, holed up in the rubble of the farmhouse in acute danger. There now followed a brief period of stupidity. The command centres of both sides, German and Russian, through Possessidov, only the sketchiest knowledge of the events in the villagey, opened fire with artillery and Stalin organs respectively. It lasted only a few minutes, wiped out a Cossack battalion, which was in the open and unprotected, and claimed a few Jaeger. A short respite of eerie silence followed, and then came the next cavalry charge and death ride. Our numbers, inadequate armaments and equipment, and few medical facilities dwindled under the pressure on our makeshift positions. The regiment, 300 strong at the beginning of the action, had 168 dead and wounded, and was cut off from division. Its survival was now in doubt. In this precarious situation, Regimental Commander Oberst Lorch took upon himself the initiative of an immediate breakout attempt for early next morning. The companies were informed by dispatch messengers. It meant leaving behind the worst of the wounded, but there was no alternative. The few surgeons and medics made the rounds classifying the wounded. Those listed to remain were given a pistol if they requested it. The arrangements were made swiftly and without sentimentality. At midday, the Field Reserve Battalion northwest of Bakalov encountered extraordinarily accurate fire from a patch of dense woodland. Within a few minutes, eleven of their number had fallen to rifle bullets to the head or chest. The cry of snipers drove the remainder to cover. Two company commanders, who rose too high for a peep with binoculars paid with their lives, heads splayed by explosive rounds. The number of hits led to only one conclusion. The battalion was facing a sniper company. We had heard rumours of such a thing, but so far had only ever come up against marksmen operating singly. Lacking artillery or mortars, the battalion was helpless. Fire was coming from the impenetrable vegetation of a small forest of conifers. Bursts of MG fire had no apparent effect, and the devastating response it evoked was usually fatal for the gunner who tried it. The Jaegers fell back on protected positions, such as behind the crumbling walls of a ruined collective. A dispatch rider was sent to regimental headquarter with a report and request for support. The battalion was hoping for a few heavy weapons to destroy the forest and those hiding in it, but nothing was available. My reputation was known even to Oberst Lorch, but he probably considered it to be little more than a token response when he gave the messenger a written instruction for 144 Battalion Command Centre, ordering marksman Alla Berger to engage a full Russian sniper company. Three hours later, I was being briefed on the situation in the ruined collective. The edge of the woods lay about 300 metres from these ruins. Given the depth of the wooded area, I realised I would need to get nearer and tempt the Russians into shooting to betray their positions. This required a lure. I stuffed five grenade holders with grass and set a steel helmet on top of each. With a stick burnt to carbon, I applied a nose, mouth and eyes. From my pack, I brought out an umbrella frame minus the handle. I attached grasses and twigs to the spokes, leaving just a small aperture free for vision. One hundred metres to the right of the building was a shallow depression skirted by bushes, an ideal spot for observation which I could reach by crawling, unseen by the enemy. I agreed a hand signal at which one or other of the luris would be raised cautiously above the wall of the ruin. Twenty minutes later, I was in position and set up my umbrella screen very carefully so that the movement and the slight change to the scenery were imperceptible. 
I could now sweep the wood visually through binoculars. An analysis of the enemy rounds fired demonstrated that they had a good view of our positions. This suggested height, probably the treetops. It seemed unlikely to me, however, that expert snipers would make such a cardinal error and fire from a tree without adequate cover or an escape route. I gave the agreed sign, and the helmeted lures made a cautious show. A rain of bullets greeted them from the Russian lines. This provided me with a good view of several tree branches moving unnaturally under the pressure of the muzzle blast. The fact that the enemy was shooting from the treetops and that all five lures had attracted simultaneous fire told me these were good marksmen lacking elementary fieldcraft. This lessened my worries somewhat as I contemplated taking on a very large handful of opponents. I crawled back to the ruin at once and discussed the situation with the senior sergeant who was now commander of both companies following the death of the two officers. We set up five MGs in positions with a good arc of fire towards the woods and adequate local protection. To the side, some distance away, a rifleman waited to operate a lure. While I observed the woodland through binoculars, on my instruction he raised it from cover slowly. If it attracted a shot, I would identify the location from where it had originated. The MG would then fire a burst in the general direction of the trees, masking my aimed round. It was important to conceal from the Soviets the fact that they had a sniper working against them. The tactical battle began. The lure rose and received three rounds as if to order. I saw the movement in the trees, took aim, waited for the MG to fire, then pulled the trigger. One by one the Russian snipers dropped from the trees, dead. After a quick change of position, a new round of the duel began. Within an hour I had reckoned on eighteen kills, but still the lures drew fire. It was at about five in the afternoon, and an hour since the last shot had been loosed off from the woods, that the sergeant decided on storming the woods under the cover of the two MGs and myself. They reached the woods unopposed, looked with astonishment at the corpses, and gesticulated wildly for us to join them. Cautiously, unhappy with the deceptive lull, we crossed the open land to the trees. A young woman, scarcely twenty, lay on her stomach, her rifle below her. A Yaga turned the inert body to one side to retrieve her weapon. Her right hand was inside her uniform jacket, covering the gaping wound in her chest. As the Jaga bent down, she drew a Tokarev pistol, and, gurgling blood, mouthed the expression, Death to the Fascists, before pulling the trigger with the last ounce of her strength. As the German soldier dived to one side, the bullet grazed the seat of his pants. As he rolled free, his MP40 came free, and he fired into the female torso, ending her valiant career. It was the first time we had come up against female frontline warriors. As we stood over their dead bodies, some with shattered bloody masks of flesh and bone instead of faces and features, we all felt a sense of revulsion and shame, even though we knew that there had been no alternative. If we had known in advance that we were facing women, the knowledge might well have interfered with our determination to rout out the opposition, and resulted in many more casualties amongst our ranks. The use of sniper groups was a Russian tactic that originated under German influence. During the post-First World War phase of mutual cooperation, the Weimar Republic had supplied the Soviets with the technology to manufacture telescopic sights, the use of such optics being unknown hitherto among the Russian forces. While the Wehrmacht was still issuing old Reichswehr sights in 1940, the Red Army had developed a comprehensive sniper branch with modern weapons. There were single operators, sniper and observer pairs, sniper pairs and companies up to 60 strong. From the beginning of the German invasion, Russian snipers harried the Wehrmacht, inflicting serious losses, particularly on officers, and by this means were often able to halt for days the advance of infantry lacking heavy weapons. In the heady period of victories in 1941, OKH dismissed the sniper danger as an irrelevance, and only in 1942 was the problem grudgingly acknowledged. The lack of a useful sniper rifle for the Wehrmacht was now critical, and the Model 41 with 1.5x magnification issued as a target aid for precision shooting with the 98k carbine 
over long distances was found totally unsuitable. There was nothing for it but to improvise while German industry tackled the whole problem. The simple solution was to use captured Russian weapons. Guidelines for snipers were issued for the first time towards the end of 1942, but the first firm instructions in rifle use and sniper deployment were not available until May 1943. According to these rules, snipers were to be directly under the control of company commanders and exempt from daily routine. Their role was special reconnaissance and sharpshooting, as their survival depended to a large degree on their remaining unseen by the enemy. The veterans among them developed a knack for wandering terrain unnoticed. Contrary to the later official training manuals or propaganda films, full-dress camouflage was rarely used. It was time-consuming, required a lot of material and restricted freedom of movement. Every sniper who lived long enough to adjust to the life used improvised camouflage aids that could be donned or erected quickly, interfered little with movement and were easy to transport. For myself, I preferred an umbrella frame with the crooked handle cut off. It was easy to dress with grasses and twigs to blend in with the natural environment and big enough to screen me. When not in use, it was easily collapsible and fitted into my battle pack. At first light on 6 April 1944, Gruppe Lorsch attacked the encirclement at the northern perimeter below the 140-metre spot height, all reserves being called upon in the desperate struggle to escape. The official records speak of a heroic action planned and executed to the last detail, but the reality was organised chaos blessed with good fortune. Many men lost their nerve and fled in panic beforehand. Shortly before the decisive attack, I was queuing at the last field kitchen to fill my tea flask, when through the swathes of morning mist there came the sound of roaring motors and squeaking tracks. Everybody stared towards the noise, straining to make out the tanks. There was still nothing to see when a hysterical voice yelled, It's Ivan! He's here! Tanks! Most of the Jaeger broke and ran. The catering sergeant mounted his horse in a flying leap and whipped the animal into a gallop. Tea from the open containers aboard the wheeled field kitchen slopping in all directions. A few of the veterans tried to halt the panic. A few cuffs to the ear and kicks to the rear brought some of the men to their senses, but more than half had disappeared into the mist behind the field kitchen. The remainder waited for the death-dealing T-34s to materialise through the fog, and a few minutes later the German SP guns, which had been sent up unannounced in support of the breakout, made their appearance. It was another half hour before the last of the fleeing made their sheepish return and accepted a kick in the pants as a disciplinary measure for their action. By evening, the breakout by Gruppe Loch through the Russian lines had been achieved. The main force, Gruppe Wittmann, forced the Russian encirclement northwest of Bakalov, and German units poured through in disorder. The objective was the Kutschurgen River via the town of Getmansi. It was several hours before fighting units and engineers re-established contact between the respective groups. We had progressed about seven miles westward from the perimeter and had reached the railway tunnel south of the town of Petrovsky when there occurred a most dreadful incident amongst our own troops. My own battalion had been reduced to a pitiful rump of about sixty men. As always in these retreats, and common to both sides, Scorched earth policy meant leaving the enemy with an infrastructure in smouldering ruins. Orders had been received to blow up the railway tunnel south of Petrovsky, which for the time being was an important conduit for our troops. Our battalion was the last through it, and we saw the sappers making their last preparations to dynamite it. Hauptmann Kloss told the engineer's officer that a troop of our own engineers was following as a rear guard and that the demolition should be delayed until they were safely through the tunnel, but the explosive sappers were jittery, and when the rearguard had not shown within ten minutes, they dynamited the tunnel. Another ten minutes had passed when two filthy, dirty and distraught battalion engineers of the rearguard rejoined Gruppe Loche and reported that the tunnel had been blown up as they were passing through it. The two men had only survived because they had gone ahead as the advance party of the rearguard. The story was received with incredulity, then anger and rage. The battalion marched on, and half an hour later reached the agreed assembly point. 
a sentry called out suddenly. Stop! Stand still! Password! A rifleman of the advance party told him where to stuff his password and kept walking. The following column watched with horror as a machine gunner opened fire, raking the back of the infantryman. Seconds later, all threw themselves prostrate to the ground. Our commander pushed his way through to the front and shouted, Cease fire, you asshole! This is the Kloss Battalion. Fetch your superior officer immediately. A few minutes later, an Oberleutnant appeared and asked a few questions, which Kloss answered in bad humour. Finally, he received the instruction to approach alone. Kloss rose cautiously and, holding his pistol at the ready, went forward. He was trembling with rage. At the feet of the Oberleutnant, Kloss saw the killer gunner sitting behind his weapon. He was no more than a youngster, convulsed with fear. Kloss roared at him. You filthy shit! You have killed a comrade and now I am going to kill you, you swine! His hysteria built to a high pitch and became rapidly uncontrollable before he gave a long cry and emptied the magazine of his pistol into the youth, who watched his death at the hands of a German officer with eyes wide in panic. The nearest rifleman wrestled Kloss to the ground, slapped his face and forced him to calm himself. Aside from these men and the Oberleutnant, the latter of whom understood this momentary nervous breakdown on Kloss's part, there were no witnesses to the incident, and thus no further action was ever taken. The two soldiers had merely fallen for the Führer and Greater Germany, but as to the circumstances of their passing, nobody could be found subsequently who knew. That evening Gruppe Loch re-established radio contact with a neighbouring Wittmann battalion to the south of us. The outlook was not good. The structure of the latter had disintegrated and numerous independent units were involved in continual skirmishing during the 25-kilometre chase to the Kutschurgen River. Towards ten, Wittmann's HQ picked up a signal from 97 Jager Division calling all German units behind a new front line on the bank of the river, 97 Jager Division having prepared crossing points protected with the support of 257 Infantry Division. It was fairly desperate for the Russians in hot pursuit were lobbing large quantities of mortars into the retreating columns. Wittmann assembled his last artillery pieces into a battery and surprised them with a bombardment. It gained his advanced companies a breathing space, but the Russians were prompt to turn their attentions to the breach in the encirclement through which Gruppe Wittmann was still pouring. The enemy opened up a withering fire, but this was countered by desperate hand-to-hand -hand fighting supported by sniper, fire concentrated on Russian MG positions and mortars. After an hour, the determination of the Soviets wilted and the breach held. It was a moonless night and little further contact was reported. At nine on the morning of 7 April 1944, the first of Gruppe Wittmann's force crossed the Kutschurgen. His five divisions totaled 4,500 men. Third GD had less than a thousand survivors. We kept on going for three more days, crossing the Dniester on 10 April. It was a portentous moment, the end of Barbarossa, for we had passed it beyond the territorial limits of the Soviet Union and entered Romanian Bessarabia. After three years of the most bitter fighting and horrendous losses, all now knew beyond the slightest doubt that the war was being brought ever closer to the Reich. The enemy we faced on this front had to be held, forever if possible. A tiny spark of hope still glimmered that somewhere, somehow, we could stop him permanently. Whenever I had time, I would reflect on what made a good sniper. In warfare, soldiers are faced with the constant threat of serious injury, mutilation and death. Many crumble under the psychological burden and panic under pressure. This often manifests in firing off wildly or creating a mental disposition to run once things begin to deteriorate. A soldier's resistance to stress determines his quality far more than his marksmanship or other technical ability. For this reason, a sniper in prospect is difficult to spot away from the front. In particular, the selection and training of a future sniper basset only on shooting ability is a grave error, for the soldier must be possessed of a high degree of self-control and have nerves of steel. Good accurate shooting can be learnt, and the value placed on it by the military in the initial stages of the selection process is exaggerated. 
The maximum effective range for a rifle under battle conditions is 400 metres, but as a general rule half that when aiming to hit the greatest surface area of the target centrally. Absolute reliability, adherence to military routine, ruthlessness and the art of sharpshooting make the sniper not target shooting at 100 metres. So far as I can recall, the only occasion when I dressed in full camouflage gear occurred shortly after our arrival at the Dniester. We set about making our trenches homely and created a sort of village organisation based on the regiment. From thin air all kinds of utensils were produced, washrooms and showers, barbers' saloons. Poultry appeared as if by magic, treasured for their flesh and eggs and naturally guarded by their owners like the crown jewels. Foxes the human kind lurked in the shadows, casting covetous eyes at what was on offer, and the successful poultry thief was a man to be revered among the lower orders. The battalion dispatch runners, to whom I was on semi-permanent detachment, had little opportunity to cultivate company life. Their efforts for a better diet had led them down the slippery road to crimey. Their distrustful comrades watched them like hawks, but it was only a question of time before the big coop. Freely wandering the battalion lines, it had come to my notice that the CSM of the neighbouring company owned a hen, named Josephine, which could be relied upon to produce an egg daily for the CSM's table or barter. A single bird was an ideal target for abduction, for if one exercised due caution the danger of a general cacophony, such as one might expect from a disturbed flock, was absent. I was elected unanimously for the job on account of my field craft, since my red Indian instincts, not to mention cat-like agility, made me the perfect choice. It was a night of the new moon and fully overcast, ideal for a commando raid of this kind. While the others stoked the fire and prepared the cooking utensils, for the first and only time I put on full camouflage dress, blacked my hands and face, and attached leafy vegetation to my peaked cap and uniform until I looked like a bush. After receiving brief instruction from a former poultry farmer in the technique of killing a bird by hand, I disappeared into the darkness, rustling lightly in the wind. Like a fox I slunk into the headquarter of the neighbouring company. The hen was sleeping in her nest, a lovingly furbished wicker basket for artillery ammunition. There was a sentry about twenty metres away in conversation with a friend. They were sharing a cigarette, and every time either took a drag, they raised a steel helmet to their faces so that the glow from the cigarette should not betray them to the enemy. I was more on tenterhooks than normal, for this was looting, and the penalty for detection could easily be the firing squad. Scarcely daring to breathe, I lifted the catch of the wicker basket. The hen was sleeping with her head under a wing. I could not afford to make a mistake. Keeping the lid up by resting it against my forehead, I seized the bird with both hands and swiftly put her to sleep permanently. With a glance at the sentry, who was chatting and had seen nothing, I stuffed the dead Josephine inside my camouflage jacket and disappeared as silently as I had arrived. Within fifteen minutes the bird was plucked and eviscerated, and the inedible evidence carefully buried. On the morning following the grand feast, the CSM appeared and declared that he was in no doubt as to the perpetrators of the crime. Which filthy swine stole my hen? It can only have been your company because the thief's footprints lead here. None of my men would have dared lay a hand on Josephine. I would have shot him personally. Our facial expressions of hurt and reproach at the implication appeared to weaken his resolve, and, muttering to himself, the CSM withdrew after making it clear that he had narrowed his suspicions down to one person, but had no proof. He promised not to relent, however, and should the evidence he needed be unearthed in due course, the person involved would be court-martialed and shot for looting. Third GD, desperately short of men and weapons, received a token influx, mainly survivors from other divisions, which helped little. We were also given a stiffening of Romanian units, our Axis ally was very poorly equipped and armed, lacked battle experience and proved of equally limited value. On 17 April 1944, only ten days after our arrival on the Dinister, orders came for a third of 3rd GD to bolster another sector of the front under serious threat. It was my good fortune to remain behind on this occasion, 
for GJR 138 Kampfgruppe Rode was to suffer fearful casualties with over 800 dead. For a few weeks I enjoyed Halcyon days with the remainder of the division. May was a warm, gentle month, and after the troubles we had gone through to get here, our front line with a river view on the banks of the Dniester came as a delightful surprise. Germans and Russians faced each other across the river within the range of heavy infantry weapons, but limited their hostilities to the occasional exchange of mortar and MG fire and the odd commando raid to break the monotony. The river was about 400 metres wide and did not allow for reconnaissance outings by snipers. I visited the battalion trenches daily, but did no more than fire the occasional precision shot at targets spotted by our infantry. Aiming at a Soviet head 400 metres off had a 30% chance of a hit, but the effect on morale of 70%. Hair's breadth misses from a sniper's rifle made the effort worthwhile. As regular as clockwork, I made my calls on the trenches. The Russians had been lying low for days, for they were loath to show themselves once they had received notice that an expert sniper was present in the German lines opposite. That particular morning, I had been with the MG gunners surveying the enemy positions without finding a worthwhile target, and decided to pass the afternoon at the northern end of the battalion's trenches. I rarely went there, for they overlooked a bend in the river a kilometre wide, and I considered them valueless. Sometimes the belligerents exchanged MG bursts, but the range was far too long for a rifle. In our positions the mood was rather like a holiday camp. The May heat wave had gone on and on, and we had become accustomed to stripping to the waist to soak up the sunshine. Improvised showers had been rigged using the waters of the Dniester, and wonderful small picnics of ship's biscuit, tinned marmalade and ersatz coffee were quite common. At the northernmost trench I was invited to partake, the fare being all the more delicious for having been liberated from the Kubelwagen of two artillery officers who had visited the area the day before on a reconnaissance outing. During the conversation, an MG gunner mentioned hearing unusual sounds borne on the wind from the Russian side of the river. He thought the nearest thing to it he had ever heard was at a municipal outdoor swimming pool on a bank holiday weekend. This awakened my interest, and I decided to investigate. Between this last trench and the southernmost of the neighbouring battalion, was a stretch of unoccupied terrain which promised a different view of the Russian lines. About 1,500 metres further on was a small hill covered with dense bushy undergrowth offering extensive cover for observation purposes. I climbed to the hilltop from behind and peered cautiously through the high grass between two bushes. Through my binoculars I saw an extraordinary scene. Hidden from the view of our positions was a small bay. The Soviets obviously believed themselves so safe there that it was being used as a holiday beach, and, so far as I could make out, sentries and lookouts had been dispensed with. I estimated the range as 600 metres. The day was windless and the air dry. I decided to try a body shot at one of the bathers over this enormous distance. Why did I do this? It was a mixture of several things. Displeasure at our unspeakable opponents doing anything that remotely approached having a good time, my personal ambition to score a kill at this distance, and my belief in the need to make our determination unmistakably clear to the Russians at every opportunity that we were as serious as they were. I selected the largest and most immobile target. On the slope of the riverbank opposite, a group of Russians lay sunbathing in the sand, their bodies facing towards me. As I was in an elevated shooting position, it was almost the same as if they were standing. With my bayonet I dug out some clumps of earth and moulded them into a firm rest for the barrel of my rifle. I lined the cross wires of the telescopic sight above the head of the selected victim, breathed regularly and calmly a few times, took up pressure on the trigger, held my breath, concentrated on the target one last time, and fired. Like the crack of a whip, the projectile broke the stillness. After the recoil, I had the target under observation within a fraction of a second. The bullet entered the Russian just above the navel, and he folded like a penknife. I even heard his cry of pain and the panic-filled voices of his comrades. As he rolled to one side, I saw the giant pool of blood he left in the sand. 
the other Russians had scampered for cover and left him to it. After a few minutes, his movements froze and death took him. Meanwhile, I saw through my binoculars a number of uniformed Russians appear above the slope. It looked like they meant business. A few moments later, I heard the dull retort of a mortar being fired. The grenade landed on the riverbank below me and exploded. Obviously, they had spotted my position and I had to beat a hasty retreat. Weasel-like, I sneaked away and ran down the back of the hill to our trenches. As I did so, their mortars got the range of my abandoned hiding place and shredded the hilltop. Upon my return, the host of the coffee hour received me with a certain hostility. Shit, did you have to? He demanded and, turning to his men, told them to get their bunks ready, since Ivan is soon going to give us hell, adding darkly. Herr Fancy Shooter here simply couldn't resist spoiling our idyll. Hardly had the words fallen from his lips than the first MG bursts whistled over our heads, followed by a brief mortar bombardment which fortunately fell long and caused no damage. During the general hiatus, I made myself scarce, since I had no wish to expose myself to any further abuse. The next day, the occasional precision shot hit our positions. Nobody was hurt, but it told us that the Russians had called up a specialist to settle my hash. He would be disappointed, however, for a cross-river duel was out of the question. All the same, I was doubly courteous and watchful. Around 25th May 1944, our period of tranquility ended. The remnant of GJR 138 returned and 3rd GD was ordered to the Oral Pass in the Carpathian Mountains. Our new positions followed the course of the Moldau River separating the two warring armies. In addition to the watery barrier, the wooded slopes of the gently rising mountains provided us with good cover, while the land on the Russian-held side was open plain and easily observed. For once the fates had smiled kindly on the division, for the Russian strongpoint was well to the north of its positions, and locally the Soviets were interested in nothing more alarming than the occasional skirmish. Another unexpected period of tranquillity thus became our lot. Really fine summer weather offered our exhausted troops a chance of modest rest and recuperation. We readjusted quickly to trench life and slept in earth bunkers entered through a low porch of corrugated iron sheeting. A trestle table and benches for eight under the trees endowed the place with a holiday camp look again. For the man in the field, the tension of constant warring very often resulted in a voracious sexual appetite. The outlet for this natural desire for sex was only available when a unit found itself in a relatively quiet situation. While officers and senior NCOs would consort with market girls, female volunteers and Wehrmacht auxiliaries, the common foot soldier was rarely accommodated because of his low rank or standing. The German army considered rape a very serious matter and the penalty was severe. Local brothels, if they existed at all, would be unable to cope with the demand when a whole division arrived, and in any case, OKH opposed such establishments on principle as sources of venereal disease. Many men actively sought infection with gonorrhea as a means to loser their fit for the front category. The other main venereal scourge of the time, syphilis, was barely treatable, and a condom gave no protection. After contagion there would be a period of remission of several, perhaps many years before its effects began to show, and it was therefore worthless to the malingerer. Gonorrhea showed after a few days, was highly contagious, did not go away and required immediate treatment. In order to provide a sexual service and guard against its disadvantages, it was the practice along secure sectors of the front to allow a Wehrmacht field brothel to be set up. For the purpose of preventing the infection and spread of gonorrhea, these brothels had more medics in attendance than girls. Preventive treatment for everybody followed a sex session and was painful and extremely unpleasant, involving as it did a large syringe being forced into the urethra for the purpose of releasing 100 millilitres of a green sulfonamide solution into the genital tubes. All handling of the body parts was carried out by the medic. The disinfectant had to be retained for five minutes and could then be urinated free. It was reported that the latter sensation of relief was more orgasmic than the session which preceded it. Where an advanced stage of gonorrhea was diagnosed, 
the sufferer was sent to one of several special hospitals known collectively as Ritterberg, where the purpose was not only to cure the disease but to deter the patient from unhealthy future contacts by an unnecessarily barbarous method of treatment and care. Those who became reinfected were court-martialed on a charge of self-mutilation. A Wehrmacht brothel had arrived in the local town. It was staffed by five Romanian girls who charged five Reichsmarks. Privacy was afforded by a Wehrmacht blanket draped over the doorway, behind which lurked a sadistic medic waiting for the Jäger's session of pleasure to terminate and his own to begin. I had recently met up again with sniper Josef Roth, and in our long conversations the brothel question would occasionally arise. Neither of us had known sexual contact with a woman in our lives, and we agreed that this might be the last chance for the experience before death. We were still arguing the pros and cons when I noticed a supply sergeant who had delivered some ammunition and was now sitting on the running board of an Opel Blitz lorry waiting for orders. By his red beard I recognised him as the Viking who had been my platoon commander during my first five days at the front. He had divined our intentions and made us listen to an account of his own experiences at the same brothel, stationed elsewhere a few weeks earlier. His description of the drastic preventive treatment left us both in no doubt that the brief few minutes of pleasure were not worth the consequences. Being of good Catholic upbringing, I was in any case not 100% certain that I wanted my first sexual experience to take place in a Wehrmacht brothel, and by the end of the war had resisted all further temptations. By some miracle the division had been returned unexpectedly to its full quota in men and materials. The officers probably knew by now that we were at full strength for the last time. They had seen the writing on the wall long previously. What kept them all going was the determination to hold off the Russians for as long as possible. The Soviets were massing for another onslaught against the few German and Romanian divisions. The calm before the storm would be the last opportunity for the few long servers in the division who had more or less come through everything without serious injury to see their families, perhaps for one last time. So far as possible they were granted leave. At age 19, and having served ten months on active frontline duty in the German army, I amounted to a veteran, but had a lower priority for leave than fathers of children and men with two years in the army. Moreover, snipers could not be spared from the front. Theoretically, my chances of leave were nil until Hauptmann Kloss, my battalion commander, who held me in regard, found a way to resolve my difficulty. In the last few months of 1943 at the larger military depots, firing ranges were introduced for sniper training. The course lasted four weeks. Those taking part were recruited from recent conscripts, but also included veterans from the front who had been identified by their company commanders as good prospects. They would receive a sniper rifle with telescopic sight and instruction in the art. In Austria, Gebirgsjäger sniper training was held at the Sitaler Alpe military depot near Judenburg. This was not too far from my home village. Hauptmann Kloss had downgraded me to a sniper prospect in need of honing to a fine edge and thus suitable for training at Sitaler Alpe. Since I was almost at home there anyway, ten days' leave had been added, to be taken at the end of the course. A few hours before my departure on 30 May 1944, I handed my Russian rifle and telescopic sight to the regimental armourer. In my hearing he passed it to another young Jaeger, saying, You see all the little notches carved in the stock and handguard? Each is one less Russian. To receive this weapon is honour and duty. Do your best, and show Sepp on his return that you have been worthy of it. Hearing these heroic words, the young rifleman looked rather embarrassed, and I laid my hand on his shoulder, saying, Don't go mad, just remain on the alert, and keep your head out of sight making the rounds. From a breast pocket I produced a handful of bullets carefully wrapped in a handkerchief, my little stock reserved for special cases, and, pressing them into his hand, said, I probably won't be needing these any more. They are explosive rounds, so go easy with them. The supply is limited to what we can steal from the Russians. Keep on the armourer's good side, and he will keep his eye open for captured ammunition and put it to one side for you. Tell me in six weeks how you got on. 
The engine of the Opal Blitz lorry roared up impatiently, and I hoisted myself over the tailboard, the last of eleven leave-takers to board. When I shook the hand of my replacement in parting, an indefinable presentiment of his death made me shiver. The thought came to me suddenly. Poor devil, he isn't long for this world. Are you ladies through with your fond farewells yet? The driver bawled from his cab, and without waiting for an answer, stepped on the gas pedal. Our comrades disappeared behind a thick cloud of dust and exhaust fumes. A feeling of light-heartedness swept over me at my temporary release from the war, but it was tempered by bad conscience at leaving my friends in the lurch. The past year had blotted out my former existence, and the daily struggle to survive had become my only reality. It took a few days to realise for sure that the war had turned its back on me. The peaceful landscapes through which the train puffed its way on the five-day run to Judenburg seemed like an anachronism. When I alighted at the station, a driver on an errand gave me a lift to the depot in his Kubelwagen. I viewed the course with mixed feelings, for my recollections of basic training, with its endless shouting and purposeless drill, were not my fondest memories of the German army. I had only agreed to accept the course because it offered a couple of weeks of proper nutrition, regular sleep and the chance of a few days' leave with my family. Therefore I was all the more surprised to receive an almost cordial welcome from the CSM in his office, no standing stiffly to attention, no heel-clicking, just a friendly introductory talk about the course and accommodation. It was clear that this was an advanced course for specialists and not the brutal indoctrination of course material by rote. The army depot occupied a large area of terrain. The sniper school nestled in a remote barrack complex. I shared a hut with four 18-year-olds from Mittenwald who were fresh from basic training at Kufstein and had been sent from there directly to sniper school, having impressed instructors with their stoical calm and outstanding faculty of observation. My glance fell at once upon a text in Gothic lettering nailed to a wall. The sniper is the hunter among soldiers. His job is difficult and demands the dedication of body, soul and mind. Only a thoroughly convinced and steadfast soldier can become a sniper. It is only possible to destroy an enemy if one has learnt to hate and persecute him with all the strength in one's soul. A sniper is a man set apart from the common soldier. He fights unseen. His strength is based on Red Indian-like use of territory, linked to perfect camouflage, cat-like agility and masterly use of his rifle. Awareness of his abilities gives him the sureness and superiority which guarantee success. These heroic words did not leave me unimpressed, and I felt a certain pride rise within me. Yet at the same time I remembered the reality of war and its merciless nature. As you die, I thought, all these fine words mean nothing. Next day, Monday 5th June 1944, the course entitled Schafschützen Ausbildung Kompanie WK. 18 began with instruction on rifles with telescopic sights. Our instructor was a sergeant minus a leg, and nearly all the staff were experienced campaigners with partial invalidity. Many were former snipers who had worked out the field craft for themselves at the front until their wounds deprived them of their fit-for-the-front category. The course had 60 trainees, divided into 12 groups of five each, each group having its own instructor to guarantee the almost personal transmission of knowledge. A tabletop was laid with four rifles, three Mauser K98K and a weapon new to us, each fitted with an optical sight. At the front I had heard rumours of a new semi-automatic, but had never seen one. This was the Walther self-loading Model 43 with a Voigt lander, Model 4 sight. The Mausers were fitted respectively with the 15cm long Model 41, the 6-power Zeiss Zielsex and the Hensoldt Model Dialitan. After an explanation from the tutors regarding the efficiency of the four optics and mountings, they spoke about the Mauser carbine with Hensoldt sight specifically, this being considered the best and firmest combination, and the rifle with which each of us would be issued. In the afternoon we range-tested each of the four rifles. I was amazed at the wide field of vision, 
the brilliance of the Zeiss and Hensolt optics, which were far superior to my Russian scope. On the other hand, the latter and the Voyacht lander were virtually similar, and although the Walther self-loading rifle was a pleasant weapon to fire, since part of the recoil force was absorbed by the automatic reload mechanism, its accuracy fell short of the Mauser carbine. For amusement, we fired the semi-automatic fitted with the ZF-41 sight, and agreed with the tutors that its designers must have made it as a practical joke. After these free exercises, we returned to ordinary rifle shooting with the conventional K98K carbine over open sights from 50 to 300 metres, freestanding, kneeling, lying. Ammunition was freely available, and the usual safety drills were dispensed with to allow us to keep up the momentum. Next morning found us in the countryside for distance estimation exercises and the tactical assessment of terrain, the afternoon we spent shooting, and in fact there was almost no day in which shooting was absent from the timetable. During the week we were taught trench digging and camouflage. I learnt nothing new and went through the motions. Some of the camouflage ideas were very costly in time and materials, and of questionable value in practice. Hollowed out tree trunks, a full body camouflage of tree bark, a fake milestone of wood to hide a slit trench. These were ideas that seemed to have no practical value. In my experience, camouflage needed to be quickly prepared, effective, and improvised from the simplest materials available, limiting the sniper as little as possible in movement. On the last day of the first week, we were introduced to the shooting garden. About 50 metres from the firing stands was a miniature landscape designed to resemble a valley with roads and a village reduced to scale. Three small calibre army sports rifles were provided. The Volta Deutsches Sport model with four-power Eugi sight, the Men's Deutsche Sport and the Gustloff Wehrsportgewehr, the latter two both fitted with the Zer 41 optic. The exercise was to keep the landscape under observation and shoot at small papier-mâché figures as soon as they appeared at windows, between houses or behind trees. Tiny cars and horse-drawn carts moving across the landscape were also to be brought under fire, as the situation demanded. In this exercise my practical experience came to the fore. My trained eye picked out the slightest movement and it was rarely more than 30 seconds before my shot hit the target. I used only the Oigi sight. The ZF-41 had an optic of small diameter and such a poor field of fire that all trainees without exception rejected it as useless for sniper work. I obtained a perfect score in the exercise. The course tutors knew that I had some sniper experience but did not know the extent. A perfect score was so rare that they already suspected there was little more they could teach me. The shooting garden received frequent visits from use throughout the Corsi. The arrangement of scenery and location of targets was changed regularly. To encourage competition between the candidates, our daily scores were recorded and the eventual winner received the reward of a certificate and a large sack of groceries. We were required to keep a small personal notebook to list our scores and jot down observations on the terrain. On the battlefield, it was supposed to serve to note our witnessed kills as well. My roommates advised me to always use code and omit my name as owner, and most important of all, to lodge my claimed kills on an anonymous sheet with the CSM, the purpose being to avoid me being identified as a sniper if captured. Any German soldier who fell into Russian hands and was identified as a sniper could expect to be tortured to death. I saw some of the younger trainees blanch when they were told this. Monday of the second week was a red-letter day. That morning a lorry arrived from Mauser, and we helped unload a number of crates stenciled by F. They contained brand new K98K carbines fitted with the four-power Hensolt sight on an adjustable mounting. Each man received a personal issue, its registration number being entered into our individual course books. It would become our personal property upon passing the course successfully. The younger soldiers without battlefield experience were very keen to qualify for this very reason. On inspection I found the weapon to be quite a lot shorter than the Russian rifle I had been using, but the optic was far better. I could hardly wait to test the weapon that afternoon, and after the first few rounds I concluded that this was the sniper weapon which led the field. 
Our first issue of sniper ammunition was distributed from boxes bearing the designation Anschuss to distinguish them from ordinary rounds. The instructor explained that the projectiles had been prepared individually to ensure maximum precision. When at the front, we were to ask our armourers for them specifically. We calibrated the optical sight over a distance of 100 metres. This was done by removing the breech and placing the carbine on sandbags on the range table for stability. When the centre of the target was lined up through the barrel, the rifleman coincided the optic by adjusting two screws on the rear foot of the mounting using a special key. After this rough calibration, fine adjustment followed during practical shooting. The day ended with instructions never to allow the weapon out of one's hands, and throughout the remainder of the course the trainees always carried the weapon with them. All rooms had a rifle keep for use at night. The idea was to instil in us the need to protect the optic, for any hard jolt could spoil the calibration. I had learnt this the hard way during my first few days as a sniper at the front, and it now came as second nature, but the other trainees had difficulty handling the carbine with kid gloves. Since the calibration procedure had to be repeated if the weapon was knocked or dropped, the culprit was punished with twenty push-ups and thirty knee bends holding the rifle above his head. The following day we were shown a film entitled Choice Of and Constructing Positions. We were astonished to find that it was in Russian with German subtitles and had been recorded in 1935. It gave an impressive insight into the high standard of Russian training. The instructor told us how difficult Russian snipers had made the advance of German forces in 1941-1942. Compared to them, we had known nothing. Our losses among command staff from snipers had been devastating. If a unit lacked heavy infantry weapons, a Russian sniper company could pin it down all day. We had tried to get back on level terms using captured optics. On a personal note, he remarked that on his last day at the front he had personally escaped death by a whisker. Tilting his head, a little to one side, to enable us all to see the scar tissue on the left side of his face from which his glass eye stared, he explained that a sniper's bullet had struck his Zeiss binoculars and saved his life. Even as professionals, make no mistake about it, he warned, and if you notice that your opposite number is gunning for you, clear out and never fire a second shot from the same position. The film held nothing new for me, and I had begun to doze in the darkness, eyes half open, when a scene aroused my interest. It showed a Russian sniper company climbing to the treetops at the edge of a wood. The subtitles read, Treetops with plenty of leaf are an outstanding position, the rifleman cannot be seen, but has a good view of the landscape and an outstanding field of fire. These film sessions were informal, and we were at liberty to interject at any time. The instructor would then stop the projector to allow a point to be made. Indicating that I wanted to speak, the film was stopped, and I recounted my tale about the female sniper company at Bakalov. After I had finished speaking, the instructor broke the silence and said, Listen closely, Junger. The Yaga knows what he is talking about. He has already spent a year at the front. Get it into your heads that you make a mistake only once, and in 90% of cases you have shit your last. So note well everything you hear on this course, that something may well save your ass in the field. To be on the course, eating and sleeping regularly, and not in constant fear for my life, was a delight. My thoughts often strayed to 3rd GD but the censored newspaper reports gave no clear picture. Occasionally the instructors passed on information gleaned from leave-takers, and from this it appeared that the sector was quiet and the line had held. Field theory was put into practice over the next few days to test the independence of the individual. We were lodged in a common shelter and had to select a suitable spot to dig a personal slit trench for occupation early next morning. The battle scenario was that two enemy snipers had no man's land pinned down. Any observed movement of the trainee meant his end, the purpose being to teach him to lie low and consider personal strategy for the next day. Near each sniper was a tutor who refereed on claimed kills. The trainees were therefore confined to their individual trenches until night fell. Horror showed itself on almost every face, 
The value of the exercise was obvious to me, of course. To remain more or less immobile in one spot from five in the morning to eleven at night brought with it questions about food, water, and the natural functions. As a veteran, I chose and prepared a position that took all this into account. My comrades preferred, for the most part, to cover their helmets with a light camouflage of grass and fresh twigs. The day of the ordeal was baking hot. By noon, the trainees were bathed in sweat. Their limbs ached and bodily functions needed to be exercised and could not be. Early on, I had got a look at the terrain and spotted where the instructors were positioned. From then on, it was a piece of cake. I had prepared my slit trench sufficiently deep that I could lay well below the surface. In the field, this provided not only good protection against shell splinters, but enabled me to spend long periods of inactivity in relative comfort. A small drainage hole for urinating was reached by a turn to one side. I had trained my body to evacuate early morning, and the problem of solid waste did not arise. As a veteran at the front, it was routine to carry a small supply of water and dry tack. At C. Taylor Alpi, I simply made myself comfortable and spent the day sleeping and chewing biscuit and black bread. When darkness fell and the order came to return to barracks, I found many of my comrades at their last gasp. Most had wet their trousers and worse, attracting the pity observation of the Corsi Tutor. Men, here's a hot tip, first thing up on rissing, empty your bowels, or words to that effect. Next day, during the official tour of the trenches, I was asked to give the points for and against my own dugout. The course was approaching its end, and many were uneasy at the imminent prospect of spending the remainder of the war in the thick of the fighting at the front. They received a further foretaste during instruction in ammunition. Snipers often moved in no man's land between the lines. If spotted by the enemy, they would be engaged with heavy infantry weapons. In order to judge the correct defensive method, it was an advantage to recognise these weapons by the noise they made when fired. If one came under mortar attack, for example, it was only a question of time before the Russians got the range or saturated the area so thoroughly that one could not avoid falling victim. In this case, it was essential to leave the trench at once. If one could not retire through cover, the alternative was to jump up suddenly and run in wild zigzags for the German lines. As previously stated, snipers called this the Hasensprung, the hare's jump. It required a high degree of composure, but offered the only possibility of surviving the situation. Hare's leap was therefore practised repeatedly in training, yet when the hour came, many snipers preferred to remain in their foxholes in a blue funk and perished. While a real mortar could be fired for our instruction, a gramophone record was played for the acoustic demonstration of one of the most feared Soviet weapons, the Stalin organ, a multiple rocket launcher mounted on a lorry. The full battery would transform a football field into a blizzard of steel splinters and worked earth. The rhythmic howling noise of discharge played at full volume made the stomach turn. When my co-trainees asked me what was the best defence, I replied, find the deepest hole possible and pray. To round off, a new kind of infantry ammunition was shown. This was known as the B Patrone, B Bullet, B standing for Beobachtung, or observation. It had been developed originally as a tracer round for calibrating fighter weapons. The round exploded on impact and indicated the accuracy of the burst. Aerial MG gunners were able to calibrate their weapons relatively quickly using this optical aid. The ammunition was very expensive, however, and its use limited to the purpose for which it was designed. The Russians, on the other hand, had issued it to their troops from the onset of the Barbarossa campaign. It was much feared by the German infantry because of the terrible wounds it inflicted. Russian snipers were particularly keen on it. I had already had experience of explosive bullets, and to the extent that the enemy had no compunction in putting it into general use, I considered it justifiable that German snipers should receive the issue. The munition used in small arms was illegal under the Geneva Convention, but the Russians had obviously waived the right to object, and the war was at such a desperate stage for ourselves, having regard to the type of people we faced in the East, that the end practically justified any means. During a short demonstration with these bullets, 
Trees five centimetre in diameter were felled without difficulty. During the last two weeks of instruction, the course concentrated more on the practical. Besides the daily visits to the firing range and the shooting garden, we concentrated on movement in the field, passing unseen through military exercises held by other units or infiltrating between the lines. Later, the principle of the shooting garden was transferred to open terrain and a time limit imposed for spotting and shooting at the papier mache figures. For failure, points were deducted from the scorecard and death awarded. My inexperienced colleagues quickly came to understand the dangers of the life they had embraced. When these drills began, they died like flies, and I was not a stranger to error myself. Yet it was not quite so bad as it looked, for official sniper tactics were permanently offensive, while in reality, on the battlefield, many difficult situations resolved themselves by a healthy dose of caution. A good sniper had to know when it was best to vanish, but the training programme did not teach discretion.